Aubrey. Caitlin Clark versus Angel Reese. Every great player needs a foil. People are talking about women's basketball just because of one single game. I just come here to play basketball every single day. Clark and Reese have changed the way we consume women's sports. Listen to Making of a Rivalry, Caitlin Clark versus Angel Reese on America's number one podcast network, iHeart. Open your free iHeart app and search The Making of a Rivalry, Caitlin Clark versus Angel Reese and start listening. This is the best time of the year when the leaves are falling and so is is your IQ because you're listening to the Alan Cox show on 100.7 WMMS Guardians back on the field tonight last three games of the regular season against the Houston Astros who are a very good baseball team yeah 7-10 tonight is your first pitch so we will get out of here in time for your Guardians Live pregame coverage. That will start around 640 tonight, tomorrow, and Sunday will be your last three regular season games. And then Monday, they start the postseason. Sorry, not Monday. Saturday the 5th. Yeah. I, I'm like a whole week a, ahead they here. They get a bye. Get a bye. So Saturday the 5th here at home is game one. And then game two will be Monday the 7th also here at home. And then they will uh, play the away games against uh, whomever they'll be playing for those games. Yeah, I'm going to go to the game tonight. Oh, you are? Yeah. Oh, good. Alan, I saw Bill at Tom Segura a couple of times last night. Did he have as good a time as I did? Uh, If you had an amazing time, then yes, I did. It was a great show. (laughs) Wait, if they had... uh, Oh, yeah, okay. Did you have as good of a time as he did? Yeah. If he did, then you did too. Yeah, it it was a very good show. Uh, my buddy Jeff Tate was opening for him. Mm-hmm. This so was at the Romo Fijo. This was at Romo Fijo. He yeah. got us real good seats. We were row L on the floor, like right in the middle, so could you know see him. Didn't have to look at the screen the whole time. Could actually see Tom. So did that he was sell nice. it out? Uh, I they they had it sat for like probably eight or ten thousand. Okay, and there was a ton of people there. I, yeah. it looked like uh, whatever it was sat for was uh, all the tickets were sold. So it was a great time. Tom's cool. hilarious. And I feel like he, you know, I think your criticism of his latest special was it felt like too uh, built for the the podcast audience. It's he for has. people who are fans of the podcast. Whereas yeah. I don't think this new hour that he's working on is that. I feel like this is more traditional Tom Segura stand up yeah. where he's just telling stories about his life. He's undeniably a funny dude. Yeah, yeah, n- nothing along those lines. But uh, there's a lot of guys out there doing podcasts mm-hmm. and then going on arena tours and it's mostly people who just want to hear stories from the show or whatever. Yeah, no, this is However you got to get asses and seeds. Right. But, you know. And I feel like he did you know, he he he's put out a ton of material too, so he's very prolific and I feel like this is a kind of return to form what he did in mostly stories and completely normal. Yeah. Kind of kind of that kind of Tom Segura. So, very funny. Hey Paul, Hey, how are you, Alan? What's going on, Paul? Hey, yeah, you were talking about the magic shows and Chris Angel, who I love. I'll tell you what, the guy you were talking about who reveals magic shows, I used to watch it, called The Masked Magician. I think I remember that, yeah. He would uncover yeah. how illusions were done. And I'll tell you what, Chris Angel, to me, is that guy, mind freak, that is just some of the stuff I've seen him do. No matter, I kind of, I'm not into magic, but I like watching it. How some of the stuff he does, one stunt that amazed me, he was in a building, I think it was in Las Vegas or something. He was on top of a six-story building or an eight-story building and sat there and dropped a handkerchief off of the building with a rock tied in it. He caught it when he was on the ground. Uh Uh-huh. So how that was done is beyond me. Wait, you mean he he was on the roof and he tossed it and then he caught it on the ground? Yeah, because they sat back and said, here, he said, I'm going to catch this on the ground when I come down. And I'm on the radio. Uh, Sat back (laughs) and he tossed it. My, no, my wife. <laughs> Tell her to get the hell out of there. Say, hey, I'm, I'm talking right now. Shut up, Tino, over there! <laughs> Anyhow, yeah, he tossed his handkerchief tied in a rock. Not a big rock, I'm going to say, like, you know, like a large marble size or something. Threw this off the building. He was down in the crowd and caught it. 
It's and incredible. they timed the elevator. It would have taken the elevator 45 seconds to get down there, and running down the steps would have taken about a minute and a half. Yeah. I mean, just aside uh, aside from performing and nailing those tricks, I always think of, I would think the difficult thing would be coming up with the illusions. You know, because oh, you, exactly. you, you can have an amazing imagination, but that's just step one. Then you got to be like, okay, can I do this? How can I do this? Just the ideas themselves that you need to flesh out to me are kind of the most interesting thing out of all of them. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that to me absolutely blew me away on how he did that. And it just, it just was mind-blowing how he did it. Would you say that your mind was freaked, Paul? Well, yeah. Oh, God, yes. I mean, <laughs> to watch him, any special he's had on TV, I have watched him on, like, I don't know, like HBO or Netflix or whatever it is. Just to see how creative he is on this stuff is absolutely amazing. But the guy, like I said, the masked musician was a guy that uncovered a lot of stuff. Penn and Teller have been in business forever and ever. And they know a lot of the backgrounds on how these things are done. But to sit there and watch Chris Angel do the stuff he does, how he does it just blows me away. And you're also talking about the ZZ Top video. <laughs> what that is, my son's a musician. He also does a lot of uh, videography and everything else and produces music. He played the incarceration tour a couple of years ago and uh, was there with Rob Zombie and everything else and blowing my horn off to my son Daniel. And But I'll tell you what. I, that's all done on speed trick, which is basically if you were to watch high speed slow motion photography, they can back it up, edit it, and then move forward. Where I know what you're saying all of a sudden the three hot chicks were in the ZZ Top Mobile, mm -hmm. and it just that's how they do that kind of stuff. That's all, all right. It's all video. So it's fancy editing. I thought mm -hmm. they were magicians, Paul. I thought they were legit magicians conjuring naked women out of thin air. Well, I'll tell you what. Yeah. Well, that's all photo and everything else but i'll tell you what magicians are amazing people how they create illusions the way they do is fantastic and to sit back and see what they do it's you know it leaves people spellbound on how they do that and it's really kind of cool because anything you do you sit back and go wow this is really cool how the hell they do that so yeah it's not hard to figure out what we do it's all stupid and dumb <laughs> yeah. i mean anybody could okay hey thank you paul i appreciate that Little uh, insight there from Paul. The ZZ Top now, nah, sharp dressed man. I'm a buzzard. All over the port, so I'll tell you a little. I think this is the one with the naked ladies in the car. Good song, boy. Oh, boy. You know, we used to play a version of that when we had Mattitude as our intern. Remember Mattitude? Oh, yeah. He was always dressed sharp to the dressed nines, man. Every girl's crazy about a sharp dressed man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mattitude. He's still out there. We just had him on Captain Fun's Floating Fandango. Uh, spinning the tunes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like close-up magic a lot. Like the... Like table magic? Like table magic table, and yeah. card stuff because even if you know how they do it, you still can't do it. Yeah. Because they're so good with their hands of you know, hiding the cards and, and like there, there's just so much muscle memory in there yeah. that they can tell you how they're doing it, but you, you, it's still impressive. Close up magic. Mm -hmm. It's very, very, um, it's very impressive. And there used to be a guy in Tremont that would do it. And I, I'm sure I talked about him at the time, but I forget. What the hell his last name is? Paul somebody. I'd run into him. We lived in Tremont. We first moved to Cleveland, and we'd hang out at the uh, Flying Monkey. Is that what that place is called? The Flying Monkey? Yes. The Spotted yeah. Monkey? Something like Flying that. Flying Monkey. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you're listening to us on iHeartRadio, I, I like to know where people are from out of state. I've been thinking about all of our bureau chiefs down there in Florida. Uh, that hurricane just plowing through there. Andy lives in Belgrade, Montana. Brad is in Sellins Grove, Pennsylvania. Cole drives a FedEx truck in Juneau, Alaska. Uh, Jonathan listens in Lacey, Washington. And Theo checked in from New Orleans on the app. Hey, guys. It's Theo down in New Orleans. Sorry, I haven't called you in a while, but I got a joke to tell you all. Okay, listen. 
What do you call a cheese that's not yours? Nacho cheese. <laughs> oh, oh, I got one more. Hold on. What? What's orange and sounds like a parrot? <laughs> a carrot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Theo. Always glad to hear from Theo down there. Boy, you would have thought he would have had. Um, a bigger fish to fry down there in New Orleans, but uh, okay, thank you, hey, Theo. He's doing what he's got to do. Doing also, what he's got to do. I like do. that he said I uh, haven't called in a while, and I can't remember him ever calling. Oh God, Bill, you don't remember Theo? No, I oh, don't. Theo would call all the time. You think you'd remember him with such a distinctive voice? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you know, I've been on the show for twelve years. I just I can't think of. You never remember Theo no, calling no, from New Orleans. Not. Oh man, we no, we used not. to call him Theo, the one man band. You don't no, recall that? I don't. All right. Well, fair enough. Um, Oakland, California, uh, has uh, no longer has major league sports. You want to talk about a uh, city that has gotten greased up and bent over. Uh, Oakland had the A's play their very last uh, home game. I think they still have a couple of road games. But their very last home game was last night there uh, with the Oakland A's. In the span of 10 years, the uh, city of Oakland, California, has lost three major sports teams. They lost the Raiders, they lost the Golden State Warriors, and they lost the Athletics in the span of a decade. And so it's really a case study in all of the things that every city with major sports franchises complains about. Uh, billionaires who want us to pay for upgrades and things like that, or they'll threaten to take the team somewhere else. And that's never been more prevalent than in Oakland, California. They've taken their hits, boy, over the last uh, 10 years. But the last Oakland A's home game, it was packed out, couldn't get a ticket. And uh, the team was crying, the people were crying, because it's not like they don't have a fan base. And so they will go for the next three seasons and play in Sacramento. West Sacramento, I might add. Now, if you've ever been to Sacramento, California, you know East Sacramento is where you want to be. These guys are going to be in West Sacramento. They will drop Oakland from their name, obviously. They've been the Oakland A's since 1968. So their last three games of the season are in Seattle tonight, tomorrow, and Sunday. And then they'll be done. So next year, what, they'll just be the A's? They'll probably be, be the, the, Athletics? the West Sacramento A's. Yeah, I don't know. Um, and then they're going to move to Las Vegas in three years. But they lost the Raiders. Three years still. They're going to be in three. They're going to be in Sacramento for three, at least three seasons, is what they said. Crazy. So think about over the course of three seasons, they will have built up a fan base in Sacramento, who only has. I think the Kings are their only uh, major sports franchise. I think you're right. Uh, Sacramento. Do they have? No, I guess they don't have a uh, hockey team. I don't think that they do. No. The L.A. Kings are hockey. Sacramento Kings are the NBA. Where's San Jose? Is that the Sharks? Yeah, NHL. But I I know, but how far is that from Sacramento? Oh, it's not. Well, San Jose is Bay Area. Okay. So Sacramento is going to be in a different. You know, okay. San Jose is well, closer to Oakland. I mean, but, but that's one of those things where they'll have fans of that. But yeah, they're, yeah. it's not there because everybody. When I was in Sacramento, everybody was cheering for the 49 in Sacramento. Yeah. Well, yeah, you got to pick a team, right? Yeah, because yeah. it's north of the Bay Area, so you're probably not going to root for the L.A. teams. You're going to root for the San Francisco team. Yeah. Um, and so the A's are going to be gone. But, I mean, like the Raiders, Oakland Raiders back in the day were like a legit— they were a dynasty. They were, yeah, like they, they really were. I mean, they were like a heavy duty, hard the 70s, hitting team. They were seventies and eighties. They were legit, and then they moved to L.A. for a few years. Yep. What is it, like ten, twelve years? And they back back to Oakland. Back to Oakland, and now Vegas, mm-hmm. Vegas, baby. I need to get back out to Vegas. I haven't been in a while. And um, of course, the Golden State Warriors just went across the bridge. Yeah, but they, I uh, mean, they were playing in Oakland for a while. A letter from Leslie, our friend Leslie. She goes, hey, I was just at your home zoo, the Lincoln Park Zoo. You guys were talking about zoos yesterday. And we just went to the Lincoln Park Zoo. And they hired an animal behaviorist to research how the lions interact with their environment so that they can redesign their enclosure. 
Maybe they could do that here in Cleveland. That would be cool. The lion enclosure at the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo, she says, is borderline depressing. I don't know what would make a lion enclosure depressing. She describes it as late 80s. So maybe I mean, they have it updated. Small, it's and I feel like it's there's not a lot of activities for them to do. Whereas mm-hmm. if you look at the tiger uh, sanctuary or whatever, the enclosure, those tigers seem to be pretty busy, like moving around to different parts of it. They there's, got stuff to do. Yeah, on. there's big, there's big logs from the cr- climb on and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And with the lion enclosure, it's just kind of like a little hill with a little ca- like cave in it. Mm-hmm. Well, then maybe Leslie's on to something. Maybe mm-hmm. they can um, make some arrangements here at the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. But the only reason that we mentioned it yesterday is because they are the first zoo in the United States uh, to create a mini forest. So that's good uh, for conservationists. And you think they're the, growing any weed in that little forest? <laughs> I, I don't know. But what I read um, the mushroom. didn't intimate anything. Do you imagine if it turns out that, that somebody like swapped all of the things they were going to plant the night before and what they ended up planting? Obviously, they... You know, they because they had like kids from the local community organizers or something help plant. I think, there, but there had to have. I would imagine there had to be a botanist or an arborist or somewhere in the mix. But let's say that didn't happen, and they switched the old switcheroo, and uh, they planted mushrooms and weed instead of trees. That'd be pretty wild. All right, I got to take a break here. Hey, you want to go see Sepultura? I got one pair of tickets remaining. We're going to do our metal show tomorrow night. It's called Two Hours to Midnight. 